appreciate it. All right, you guys, I think we're going to get started. Did you see her? We were waiting for our Secretary Duncan, but he's on his way. But the show must go on. I would point out that all the women showed up on time. Exactly. <laughs> But he will be here. He will be here. And he's absolutely committed to this initiative. So but I'll start. I'm Valerie Jarrett. I'm a senior advisor to President Barack Obama. Welcome to the White House. I still love to say welcome to the White House. <laughs> Whereas, thank you. Thank you. We are absolutely delighted to have you all with us as we celebrate this 37th anniversary of the passage of the landmark legislation Title IX. And we've come a long way, but uh, Billie Jean and I just had an opportunity to visit quickly with the president, who is a huge fan of hers, as you could imagine, since he was a tennis player in high school, which we learned a yeah. little bit more about. And he said, I'm just delighted, Billie, that you're here today and you're participating in this celebration. But as a part of your roundtable, please spend some time talking about not just celebrating how far we've come, but looking to the future yeah. and help us understand how we can move the ball forward to the next step. And so, and so Billie Jean has some ideas of how we're going oh, to no, do I that. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely you do. That's a collective um, effort. So I'm going to do a few acknowledgments and some introductions, and then we're going to get started. Uh, one of my um, favorite roles here is as chairman of the White House Council on Women and Girls. And I'd like to begin by introducing the person who does all the heavy lifting for our council, and that's Tina Chin, our executive director. Tina, if you would. Woo! Tina! And so, right on cue, <laughs> the person who is, we'll call him the father of this legislation. You're Before kidding. you sit, I'm going to ask you to stand again. Send yes. goodbye. Please stand up. Oh. Yes! <laughs> Senator, actually, now that you've had a second to catch your breath, we're just getting started. I was beginning with introductions, and I don't want to go any further without actually giving you a chance, if you'd like, to say a few words. <laughs> I can't imagine you wouldn't want to say at least a few words for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We just so we appreciate sweet. your being here. I wanted to defer to you and your extraordinary leadership. Also, if you would join me in acknowledging Christine Brennan from USA Today, a columnist, author, and commentator. Where are you, Christine? Right here. here. You are. Yeah, baby. You guys have the orange on. Yeah, you guys are matching there. I know. Donna Duverona, Olympian, first president of Women's Sports Foundation, sportscaster, and now helping to bring the Olympics to my hometown, Chicago. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Lillian Green down. Chamberlain, Olympic gold medalist in track and field. Have it up, baby. Please come on. <laughs> Woo! Give it up to Lillian. Have it up, baby! <laughs> Jonah Lohman, professional soccer player with the Washington Freedom. to all of the outstanding Title IX advocates, professional athletes in our audience today, I'd also like to acknowledge the young women from the YMCA National Capital and the FIRST Robotics Competition Team. Thank you guys yeah. for being here. And now, without much further ado, I'm going to introduce our secretary, of education, Arnie <laughs> Duncan. Come on in, Arnie. <laughs> there are some uh, high fives out in the hall from our team who, who managed to note that you walked in exactly on, on cue. So we thank you for being here. Late as usual. I've had the privilege of knowing the secretary, I think probably since he was um, a very young boy. We're having both grown up in Chicago in the same neighborhood. We couldn't have 
a stronger advocate on behalf of women and in education in general. Because as we know, if we're looking after the girls, we're looking after everybody. Yep. And so with that, I want to introduce Arnie. He's going to say a few words, and then he's going to more formally introduce Billie Jean King, and then I will introduce the rest of the panel. So Arnie, all in you. Well, thank you so much. And it's absolutely a thrill to be here. And Valerie, I want to thank you for your tremendous leadership in so many different ways. And this is just a really important thing. And it's great to see all the young girls here. So welcome. Pretty cool to be in the White House, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, all of us owe a debt of gratitude to the White House Council on Women and Girls for its work now and going forward in the future to ensure that American women and girls are treated fairly in all matters of public policy. It is an absolute privilege for me to be included in this tribute to mark the 37th anniversary of Title IX, an absolute landmark piece of legislation that has opened doors for a generation of women and girls. Many today's students would be surprised by what our schools, look, schools and colleges looked like on this day in 1972. In fact, before Title IX, women were much less likely than men to receive undergraduate, graduate, or post-secondary degrees. Girls were not encouraged to pursue math and science because too many people believed girls couldn't excel in those subjects. Women and girls comprised a shockingly low percentage of the athletes in high schools and at the collegiate level. And school support for female athletes and their teams were often inadequate and sometimes literally non-existent. Today, many obstacles have been removed by Title IX, the Department of Education's vigorous enforcement of the law, and the efforts of our nation's educational institutions to eliminate discrimination based upon sex. The percentage of women who enrolled in college immediately after graduating from high school has grown from 46% in 1972 to 68% in 2007. Women now make up 57% of the total enrollment of, uh, in colleges. And at the same time, the percentage of doctoral degrees awarded to women has grown from 16% to 50. And as you know, Title, I, Title IX is about so much more than athletics. However, Title IX has produced great results in school athletic programs as well. The percentage of women participating in collegiate sports has grown from 15% to 43%. And the number of girls participating in high school athletics has increased dramatically from fewer than three, 300,000 girls in 1972 to nearly 3 million, an increase from 7% to 41%. But despite the significant progress in so many areas, everyone in this room knows we have a long way to go. Women and girls can continue to represent a disproportionately low percentage of students and employees in traditionally male fields, such as science and math. And for this reason, the Department of Education continues to strive to remove the obstacle of sex discrimination and increase access. So I'm very, very pleased today to be able to announce the award of $2.4 million in grants to 13 groups to support and enhance projects that will help our high school girls achieve higher proficiency in math and science education. These four-year grants were made uh, possible under the Women's Educational Equity Act the program provides financial assistance to help educational agencies meet the requirements of Title IX. A tangible example of the work supported by these grants is seen in Pittsburgh, which is teaming up with Smart Futures and the Carnegie Science Center's Girls Math and Science Partnership to develop and implement a four-year program for girls in grades 9 through 12 called Gaining Equity Through Mathematics. Programs such as this the work of the White House Council on Women and Girls, and many Title IX advocacy groups are extremely important to ensure fairness and access. This work is absolutely critical for the success of our students and for the competitive future of our country. Thank you, and now my real job and honor is to introduce Ms. Billie Jean King. <laughs> Billie Jean is recognized as a champion for social justice and equality. She created new inroads for both genders in and out of sports during her legendary career and the decades since she walked away from tennis. King won, this staggered me, won 39 Grand Slam singles, doubles, and mixed doubles <laughs> tennis titles, including a record, record 20 titles at Wimbledon. Think about that, it's staggering. She defeated t tennis champion Bobby Riggs in the Battle of the Sexes match in 1973, which I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Few of us watched that one closely. And that had a powerful impact on, soci on society and contributed so much to the women's movement. That same year, King founded the Women's Tennis Association, and in 1974, she helped to found the Women's Sports Foundation. King was named a global mentor for gender equality by UNESCO in 2008, 
and received the NCAA President's Gerald R. Ford Award in 2009, recognizing her contributions to improving higher education and intercollegiate athletics. Please give a warm round of applause to a true champion on and off the court. <laughs> Secretary Duncan for those kind words, uh, um, and also to Valerie, thank you again, uh, as Secretary Duncan said, about your leadership. Uh, today is a thrilling day for all of us. Um, I don't want to cry, because <laughs> Valerie and I are almost crying before we started, but um, it's the 37th anniversary of the 37 words that made up one of the most important pieces of legislation of the 20th century. Um, and as we look, we stand on the sh shoulders of the pioneers that be came before us. I always, we're always indebted to them, many of the people in this room. Uh, to Senator Birch Bayh, I cannot thank you enough. I will never, th could ever thank you enough for leading this cause especially with the Senate and how you had to deal and compromise to make this actually happen. Um, to uh, Congresswoman Patsy Mink, Edith Green, who in the end didn't want to vote for it, but she started it in many ways. These are some of the people that we can, we're indebted to for forever and every, every single generation that follows. Uh, this is about the health girls and women. It's about the mind, body, and soul. And in the future, I think we really need to keep working on to match up the heart and minds, the heart and minds of people uh, to match up with this legislation. We still have a long, long way to go. But you can have legislation, but the culture and changing the mindset and the hearts of people is really has to happen over time. And thank you to the parents and caregivers of girls, and particularly thank you to the fathers <laughs> of daughters. Uh, I know my dad was very important to me, and I know to those. And uh, I, I think it's wonderful that we have science and math, sports and education all at the same table. This, this relates to each and every one of us, and we can all help each other in this endeavor to have equal opportunity for boys and girls across the board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Billie Jean. We're both trying hard not to cry here. For those of you who are out in the hall, come on in. There's plenty of room around the back of the wall. You don't have to stand out in the hall. Come on in, guys. These are my team. Come on. I want you guys in here to hear this. <laughs> so, Billie Jean, I have to say to you on a personal note, I remember your match against Bobby Riggs like it was yesterday. I was 17 years old in high school. And I really felt, I was a tennis player, a very mediocre tennis player, I would add. <laughs> but I really felt, watching you on the court, that my future was in your hands. And Billie Jean was saying to the president earlier, she was so nervous because she had to win, and she's so competitive. But this match of all matches, it was just so important that you win. And I just wanted you to know, as somebody who was out there pulling for you, it Thank was so you. important to me <laughs> Thank that you beat him, because he talked so much trash all the time. <laughs> he really did. He was a talker. Wasn't he a talker? Oh, yes. oh my gosh. Trash talk is trash. big in sports. It is Very big. big. <laughs> it is big. But I just wanted you to just pummel him, and you did. And so we were proud of you that day, each Thank day. You. And also, also, what you have done since you were a competitive athlete, your leadership, the um, organizations that you have sponsored, the role that you have played to not just better the lives of, of the people that you love, but for all of the girls out there. I just can't tell you how much he's done. And uh, to the degree you have helped girls, you have helped families, you have helped young folks, you've gotten people involved. We were talking earlier also about, and you should actually take a second maybe to describe what you're doing now. 
we're gonna, this is going to be very fluid here. We have a script, but we may not be following the script. Because I was struck by it, and I think it's important for everybody. What I'm doing now? What you're doing With now in life? terms of having the, the boys and the girls playing together on the competitive mm -hmm. playing field, and that sets a nice framework going forward. Well, for 34 years, we've had world team tennis. And we have uh, at least two men and two women on each team. And so there's equal contribution by both genders, both the boys and girls. They're on a level playing field. And if you ever go watch a world team tennis match, then you see my philosophy on life. And that is girls and boys working together and helping each other to better each other um, in our lives in every way. So, and uh, that's, that's what I'm doing. And also, obviously, the Women's Sports Foundation. I'm still uh, on the board, um, which is important to me. And then, but World Team Tennis is really my core business. I've been a small businesswoman since 1968, which most people don't realize. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's, I, I think that's what's important. Yes. It's this togetherness to help each other. So now, let's introduce the rest of the panel. I'm going to kick it off with some questions um, after I've introduced you. But we're going to you know, mix it up. Feel free to add on. You don't have to. Uh, just the person who asked the question is not the only one who has to answer. And if everyone would keep in mind at some point during your remarks, give us some advice of what we can be doing going forward. So first, let's start with Marsha Greenberger, the president of the National Women's Law Center. Welcome, Marsha. Thank you. Hey, Marsha. <laughs> Woo! You go, girl. <laughs> Then we have Shirley Malcolm, the head of directorate for the Education and Human Resources Program for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. You've got a mouthful there. <laughs> also, please welcome Jessica Mendoza, the current president of the Women's Sports Foundation. And keep going on over here. And then, of course, we have. I did Christine Brennan already. All right, Dominic hold on, you guys. Dons, I know I see Dominic, but I'm looking for <laughs> I'm looking for everything on you. Well, Dominic Dons, of course, everybody knows oh, our Olympian, you. right? For you. Olympian. Yes. Gymnastics, former president. There she is. Olympian and gymnastics, former president. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Sorry, you're very helpful. <laughs> former president of the Women's Sports Foundation, and of course, an Olympian, and then of course. I want to introduce our Joyce Winterton. Joyce has recently joined us, and Joyce, we're, Joyce is the thank you assistant administrator for education of NASA, and then Russell Alley, the assistant secretary for civil rights, the Department of Education. Welcome to you all. <laughs> so, Jessica, let's start with you. So. Obviously, Title IX has been very important, and it op opened up opportunities. But I'm curious as to, in addition to sports, how else do you think it's shaped the lives of the women who benefited from it? Oh, okay. right here. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Mendoza. Softball. Well, I'll be in. Yeah. Sorry. I'll just promote you. <laughs> She's my promoter. Obviously, growing up and having the opportunities, and Billy discussed a lot of this, is... Um, being able to feel like I'm an athlete and not just um, a female that's out there playing sports and that's something that um, growing up I played baseball with all boys and then switching over to softball and uh, the confidence that it's given me the rest of my life and that's something that with the teenagers that 13 to 18 year old age group is those life skills that you really gain playing sports and I, you know I grew up with a lot of dis tough decisions and uh, I think about how that could have gone either way um, but then being able to now represent my country in Olympic Games based on that confidence that I was given as an athlete, not just um, some chick on the field that can kind of play or, you know, re renaming how to throw like a girl, things like that allowed me to go on and, and represent my country. But I think the important thing is, is there's a lot of girls that don't have that. Right. And um, I want them to be able to, to go on that same path and not so much to be an Olympian, but to definitely be confident young women. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now, Joyce, you know, it's interesting. We're talking about sports, but obviously we're still dissatisfied with the number of women who are going into science and technology. And so maybe you could share a little bit about what you think Title IX did, but also what can we do today to try to get more girls involved in science and math? Well, Title IX was critical in opening that door for women and girls, but women and girls still have to choose to go through it. 
So they have to take that effort to work harder in science and mathematics and consider careers in technology and engineering. Uh, so NASA and our other colleagues at uh, the federal agencies provide real world experiences. So science and math and is an abstract. You see how it's applied. So for instance, our first robotics team that's here from Virginia, they competed in local, state, and national building robotics and robots that actually had to perform a task. And they competed. And they worked in teams and cross teams. Um, and then you have to see about that further you can go. So we have undergraduate and a postdoc here who's looking into deep space. So I think we need to help young people believe that not only they can excel in graduating, but in those careers. And we need more entrepreneurs who are women in technology and innovation. So I think we're, we've made a huge progress. We're not done yet. Uh, but I think together we're going to continue to see more women in leadership positions in STEM disciplines and in science and excelling in engineering as well. Thank you, Joyce. Now, Marsha, obviously it's very important to get the legislation passed. But then, in addition to that, you have to be able to enforce it and bring the private right of action. So maybe, and you've obviously had a long track record, could you share a little bit and help educate everybody on what, what um, the opportunities are in private enforcement and what you think we should be doing now to help give you the support you need to make those cases easier? You know, one of the things about the law is it's a promise that the country makes to all of our nation's daughters and sons that we stand behind equality in education. And I've heard Senator Bai and so many people in this room with enormous eloquence talk about what it's all about is opportunity. But it means, as Billie Jean said, changing the hearts and minds of the country. And sometimes you need the force of the law to get people's attention. And it sometimes means you have to fight for those rights. They don't, even though we've got the law in the books, we don't always automatically mean, uh, that means that we can just go in and expect miraculously to, for everything to be fair and open. So it took a lot of fighting, even once Title IX was passed, to get good, strong regulations from the Department of Education, which we mostly now have, although I think they, they could probably be improved. We had a little bit of a slip in that, <laughs> uh, over the last few years, but we know we could get those strong regulations back. We got some work to do. Right, right, right. But in addition, we, because people stepped up, we have the right to go either to the Office for Civil Rights with a wonderful new head and ask for the help of the Department of Education if you've got a complaint, if you see unfairness and discrimination. You know, Title IX means no sexual harassment in schools. So if you want to go take a shop course, and people are, the teacher's giving you a hard time, and some of the male students are giving you a hard time, and you can't get the proper teaching, you have a right under Title IX to be treated fairly, and you can go to the Office of Civil Rights and their regional offices I know all over the country and file a complaint, and off, organizations like mine, the National Women's Law Center and others are here to help American Association of University Women, the Y and many others, and Women's Sports Foundation in the sports area. You can also go to court. And we've had incredible people who have gone to court, and the, uh, even the Supreme Court has interpreted Title IX to make clear you now do have a right to be protected against sexual harassment. You can't be retaliated against if you file a complaint. You have to be given a right to equal scholarship opportunity. These are all <coughs> across the board. You can't be told no Cisco systems in, in programs that a lot of young women take. Uh, these are, happen, these rules, these regulations, these promises, legal rights that parents and students can take advantage of, but it does sometimes mean being willing to fight and step up. Thank you very much. Well, let's shift to Dominic. So Dominic, you travel all over the country, probably the world, and you're a role model and a spokesperson and a wonderful example of what hard work and competition and fair play can do. 
tell us a little bit about what you think um, we should be doing or sensitive to in terms of the media and the messaging that we see around girls in competition. Well, I think we need to be very aware of the messages that are communicated to our young girls. And first, if young girls are not given opportunities, the message is that they don't have any value in sports. Um, the whole thing is, is making sure that young girls are participating and engaged in their lives. And that's what Title IX is all about. It's not a suggestion, it's a law. And we need to ensure that our young girls are given opportunities. And in the media, that when they do something in the world of sports that it's talked about. And we have, as you introduced earlier, Christine Brennan, who makes it a point to um, communicate when women in sports are doing amazing things. Because if you look at the newspapers today, it is very <coughs> hard to find um, stories about women athletes, individually <coughs> or in teams. And I truly think that's a negative message that we're sending to our young girls. If they look and they're reading the newspaper, they're on the web, and they don't hear a lot of, about a lot of female athletes, then it's almost like female athletes are really not strong enough role models for them to read about. And so I think we need to have better coverage of women in sports. I definitely would say during the 1996 Olympics, uh, because during those Olympic Games, uh, I was a part of obviously a, an amazing gymnastics team, and there were a number of other women's teams that won. Um, however, following, following those Olympic Games outside of that media, women's sports really was not talked about. And I know there's been a fight for women's softball. Also, there was a fight for professional women's soccer. And more and more, we need to hear about the amazing thing that, things that these women are doing. I get a great deal of fan mail. And a, a good percentage of my fan mail, fan mail letters come from young men and young boys, and not what you're thinking about. It's truly, <laughs> it's not, it's not. It's truly because those young boys and those men saw me as a role model for them as well. Just like Lillian Green Chamberlain has been a role model for young boys. Just like Donna De Verona has been a role model for young boys outside of the swimming pool. And so the thing is, we need to think about not only the way um, the media is communicating, what it's communicating to our young girls, but also what it's communicating to our young boys. And just one thing I wanted to stress, my focus today is on educating and empowering people. And I think the thing is today, we need to educate our young people We need to educate the teachers and the officials on their rights. And once people are educated, they're empowered. And not that we wouldn't need to have these round tables. I mean, this is a great event for the 37th anniversary of Title IX. I was not born. I was definitely a beneficiary of it. However, the thing is, is once the parents know, rub it in. Once the, once the young girls know their rights, once the parents know their rights, they're going to speak up and they're going to use their voice. I get numerous emails from parents, from, from young athletes about issues that have to do with Title IX. Just recently, it was a couple of months ago, Fairfax County, I'm not trying to point one or learn area out, but Fairfax County, Virginia, was going to drop, a high school team was going to drop their gymnastics team. A mom reached out to me furious furious thinking I could flip down there and do something about it. I, I sent them over to the Women's Sports Foundation and other wonderful organizations and I'm proud to say that because that mom was so passionate and the students, the young gymnasts were, that were behind it, their gymnastics team was reinstated. However, the thing is, is it comes first with education and we empower the people and we will hear the people's voice. We know a little bit about that. Empowering the people. <laughs> All right, well, Shirley, you too are faced with the challenge of getting women into graduate school in the sciences. Would you like to share your thoughts and, and if there are things that we should be doing to make your job easier? Well, I only wish that uh, we could communicate the message to. In fact, this is something that is, that is valuable, it is not just nerdish. Uh, that in fact that you make a contribution to the world, uh, the people who are going to have to solve our problems in energy, in climate, in feeding the world, in sustainability, those are women scientists and engineers and men scientists and engineers. And I think that to basically say that we're only going to take 50% of the talent is tying our hands behind our back, especially at a time when the, the kinds of, of uh, challenges that we face are so very grave and so very important. Uh, I think that if we could have uh, the opportunity for 
uh, for young women and young men to be supported uh, in, their, in their graduate study. Uh, we still have all too many uh, young people coming out with debt uh, out of graduate school, and they're not promised to get high-paying salaries when they come out because they're going into research or other kinds of settings where, that we absolutely need. We absolutely need them to be looking for ways of dealing with H1N1. We absolutely need for them to be figuring out how we address uh, alternative energy and things like this. But in fact, they're, they're unlikely to get a lot of remuneration uh, uh, in, that, in those kinds of contexts. So I think that the, the notion about let's support them while they're there, and then let's support them after they leave in terms of allowing them to freely enter onto the faculties of many of our institutions. We know that women still face problems with regard to uh, their position on, on faculties. I don't know how many of you saw the research that came out a couple of weeks ago about the Air Force Academy and the women who were in the Air Force Academy and then the, uh, that it matters who teaches the women uh, these courses, these science courses. Uh, that they, in fact, uh, that their performance is very much uh, tied into the presence of the need to have women faculty uh, who are there uh, teaching and providing leadership for the men as well as for the women. So I, I would hope that there would be ways to really not only continue to work to move the numbers, but also willing to work to put them in positions of power so that they can, in fact, exert the kind of leadership that is needed within the sciences, engineering, and, and mathematics. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Rosalind, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the challenges that you see, what enforcement um, actions are, are on the horizon, what we could be doing to do a better job here. Thank you. Um, I think we've heard a lot about that today. As Marcia indicated, many believe there has been some slippage. That was a very nice slippage. way <laughs> 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 so I nice to it. I say to we're going to work on no more slippage. <laughs> <laughs> but you also heard about the kind of education that needs to happen for all of us, right? When we know our rights, we move on it and we act. We want to make Title IX the kind of bulwark that it's been in women's athletics, that same force when it comes to STEM. That's about making sure that discrimination is no longer allowed to persist and exist, that we find that harassment that Marsha referred to and we nip it in the bud. We need your help to do that. That is about, as Marsha indicated, bringing those complaints to the Department of Education, to the Office for Civil Rights, so that we can vigorously enforce your rights. It's also about using the investigative authority um, that lies within the Office for Civil Rights to find those places where women and girls are still barred from access to those rigorous courses that will prepare them for this competitive and global interconnected marketplace. It's about the kind of public campaigns that today's event really um, it shows what's possible when you have an administration that cares. I am excited to see what happens after today. It shows the power of the bully pulpit. I keep hearing rumors that this, in fact, was, is the very first time that the White House has ever commemorated the anniversary of Title IX. That is a very, yeah. very big deal. <laughs> It's about going further. Now it's about learning from the last 37 years, mm -hmm. learning from the successes, and learning some from some of the slippage, and learning <laughs> from some of the mistakes, and making sure that 37 years from now, we see icons in the audience, just like we see icons on the stage, that will say no longer is there a gender gap when it comes to access to those rigorous courses that prepare us to compete. No longer is there a gender gap when it comes to those science, technology, engineering, mathematical fields. No longer is there a gender gap when it comes to enrollment in those higher order post-secondary degrees. We've come a long way, as you've heard about today. Six percent, just six percent of doctorate degrees were awarded in 1972. In 2005, that number grew substantially, but we're still at only 28 percent, right? 
So we got a long way to go. The good news is because of the history, Senator Bai, thank you. Because of the future, I am more hopeful than I have ever been before in this arena. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Share with everyone. <laughs> Today, I think for a lot of us, it marks a new beginning with President Obama and his administration, and to Valerie, and to people like you, and, and to Secretary Duncan, and to everyone, whoever is up here and beyond and became before us. But this is a new beginning, is what I thought about this morning when I woke up. This is an opportunity that we have never had, and let's take advantage of it, all of us, and helping each other. And uh, that's it. I just keep thinking about geometry, though, because the only time I cared about math was because I could relate it to my tennis. And I, and I do that with every tennis time. I, anytime I teach anything in sports, I talk about science and math and how we use physics and everything we do and try to make it interesting. And that's when math came alive for me is when I related to something I'm interested in. And I know I always try to find the child's interest. Right. And then I hit them hard. I go, how's your science and math going to school? <laughs> huh? They don't like it. I say, and then I get them out on the court. I got to talk about perpendicular. Do you know what that means? If they're young, they go, huh? You know, I just try to, try to get them to think, you pay attention in your class. Because that'll, it'll make it fun for you. And, they, and I get them, by the time, that's my goal, is get them excited about yeah. science and math with sports. And in sports, we have to keep score. There's math always involved. There's angles. There's depth perception. There's physics. There's kinesiology. There's all these things that we can relate to and get us excited. And nerds rule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always love the nerds the best. The I do. I love them. They're it's, smart. You know, fun. Billy, you know, Billy Jean, um, a lot of people who have been, who have complained about the idea of using Title IX uh, with regard to uh, STEM fields. Mm -hmm have talked about the fact that you're wanting to push women into places where they're not interested. Well, I, I, you know, I, I started thinking, I heard that same language somewhere else. Yeah. Sports. <laughs> in sports. I heard, totally. it in, I heard it in a lot of other places. Well, Everything. women aren't interested in going into business. Women aren't interested. And, and I think that, that the, we have to basically counter that with the examples of where people are going in and they're being successful. And with the kinds of examples that you provide where interest is stimulated mm -hmm. in these fields by tying them to things that people already care about. Yes. And that there, it isn't just something that you're born to do. It is something that you can be inspired to do. You want to save the world? Guess what? Yet you can go into engineering and build better wells and pumps for people who don't have water in developing countries. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. lots of good that can be done and can be accomplished. And you can perceive these as, as fields where you can reach out and you can help and you can make a difference in the world. Well, I've seen Jessica Mendoza give a softball clinic. And <laughs> she got me all inspired just to want to do more, <laughs> make a difference. And so it's the same thing with Dominique. They've been, I've been, you know, they've been, we've been around each other. And they're just so inspiring. And I mean, if this is the future of our country, I'm feeling pretty good about it. Good <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Billie Jean, and then we're going to open it up to those of you in the audience who may have questions from our panel. But when we were visiting with the president earlier, you mm -hmm. shared with him, he was talking about his girls and how they enjoy tennis, and mm -hmm. you shared with him the importance of the role that your father had played. Maybe you could share that with the audience, because to the dads out there and to the moms, too, I thought you made a really good point about the importance of your father. Yeah. Well, just to talk about moms for a minute, yeah. you talked about moms there. As goes the health of a mother, it usually goes the health of a family. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they are vital. So we can never forget our moms either. But my dad made a difference because my brother who was a, a professional baseball player with the San Francisco Giants. He treated us the same, that we could have our dreams, whatever we wanted. They never pushed us, by the way. <laughs> Nobody can believe it, they didn't. And he. Um, <laughs> He just, he would do anything to help me. If I wanted to play catch for three hours, he would play catch with me. If he would let me bat the ball, I would bat it for hours. Poor guy. I mean, I don't know how he did it. <laughs> you know, thank God he was a firefighter because he was home every other day because of that. He was 24 hours on, 24 hours off. 
and he would do anything for my brother and me to help us. And because he was a good jock, he was good at instruction, but it's what the lessons in life that we get from these experiences. Whether it's building a robot and being teamwork and having teamwork, or whether it's in sports, whatever area of life, but my dad really taught my brother and me to do the best we can, but he really treated me the same that, Billy, you go ahead and dream your dreams, even though you're not going to have as many opportunities because you are a girl. That was very clear by the time I was 10, 11. It was very clear that we're discounted. Nobody calls on us in the classroom. Um, all the, I mean, it just it was, went on and on. So he was very good. And another thing he did, which I just love, is he never let me read another press clipping after, the, after I was 15 years old. <laughs> he said, you're not allowed to read them? Because guess what? They're talking about yesterday. And today is what matters and what you do to, today and tomorrow. And I, to this day, to this day, I, I don't read my stuff. I just don't read it because it's just he ingrained that so much into both of us. And, it, and I think it keeps you in the now, in the present of life. And I think it also helps um, just stay humble, hopefully, stay grounded. But my parents, if, oh, if I could clone them for every family in this world, they will keep you grounded and humble. <laughs> no, I mean, they're boom. You know, one thing that I just wanted to say, because this is such a hopeful time, is that it really takes work. And we have so much now, so much enthusiasm to move things forward. And we don't always move forward without a lot of work. I know that, it, believe it or not, in the middle 80s, there were more young women getting advanced degrees in computer Computers. science than they are today. That's right. We've actually been losing <laughs> yes. ground in some areas, and we've still got even fights to get stronger laws. One of the things that's been terrific in the area of intercollegiate athletics is there's now a law that's a companion to Title IX that makes uh, requires that schools keep statistics about just how are they treating their female athletes and their male athletes. But we don't have that for high schools. And there's a High School Athletic Disclosure Act that's been pending in Congress. And boy, you know, there's an expression, sunshine is the best disinfectant. <laughs> if, you, if you've got to kind of look at, OK, what kind of resources if I'm putting into my girls' programs and boys' programs and make that public, it captures a lot of attention. And then it really can make a difference. And we know how interconnected so much of this is. We've been working on issues involving dropouts, which is a, such a, a national problem that I know that the Secretary is working on every day. And it's a problem plaguing our boys, for sure, but also our girls. And we've seen young girls who can't play sports because they have to go home, they've got uh, child care responsibilities for their younger siblings. They've got other kinds of issues that, that make them less connected to school than they would have been. And we also know f still for young women that for them to get good paying jobs, they need these advanced degrees. To make up the salary gap today, mm -hmm. they need more education. And Title IX and the fights that we're talking about today in moving forward, Valerie, just as you asked, I think we could still use some more of those laws. <laughs> and we want to make sure that more of those funds keep going into these kinds of demonstration projects that really work out. It was a fabulous announcement. And to get that word out and uh, that to know that we've got the resources of the Department of Education, letting people know what really works so we in communities can replicate it. That's, that's the name of the game in the future that's very exciting. Okay, Tina, let's go. Well, you up? I was going to say, as we go to questions, we're talking yes. to you been streaming this live on the web. And we're taking questions and comments from oh. people across the country. And Ashley Vibe does our education outreach. Just saying, no, has an Perfect. This is AD's, too. Yeah. Yeah. You know what to do. You're smarter than anybody. Yes. The urban girls. Um, first, it's about being honest and open and having the tough conversation with these kinds of data. 
The New York Times article and so many others have sparked a kind of renewed attention into this gap. It's about being honest in having the political will and courage to target the interventions, the dollars, the needs for those young girls that are most often lagging. It's about us in this room having a kind of conversation that talks not just about the gender gap, but about the racial gap that often conflates with the gender gap, the socioeconomic gap that makes it all the more harder for young women and girls to have access not just to those high paying jobs and the good courses, but also to fair sports. Um, and it's about never letting stories like that go without following up immediately and making sure that we use the leverage, the strength of Secretary Duncan, the power of this administration to do something about it. Um, but it also, as you heard about today, requires a kind of partnership with those in the field, in the public, bring those complaints, we can't say it enough, to us. It both gives us the leverage to make sure your rights are protected um, and the power to ensure that similarly situated young women and girls across the country don't have to go through those experiences in order to get their just desserts. Thank you. Now, those of you who are here, don't be shy. Come on. Yes, please. And introduce let's hear, let's, yourself. Let's hear from the girls. I'd love to hear from you. Yes. Yeah, Tell us good. who you are, where you're from, and then I'm open it up, up for your girl. questions. Stand up. Up you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is good experience. My name is Katie Cleveland, and I'm from uh, Herndon High School, which is in the Northern Virginia area. And first thing I want to say is um, thank you, because it was our gymnastics team that you saved. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. wow. Thank you. Well oh, good. Excellent. Oh, wow. That's but, great. Um, my first question is that how are we going to get to tell girls that it is okay to go into science and math? Because there are a lot of people that I know that when uh, even smaller girls that are friends with my sister d say, no, science is only for boys. No, we can't, we can't be good in it. We, it. It's not for us. We're supposed to be good at English and history and things like that and not the science and math. And I want to know how we're going to reach out to those girls and tell them it's okay. Let me ask you, how did you get into science yourself? Um, well, in third grade, we had this whole uh, space day mm -hmm. stuff, and um, <laughs> I, <All right>. I decided <laughs> that I wanted you want to build the rocket that went up to Mars instead of actually be the one that took it there. So, <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's cool. Totally. That's great. Go That's girls. terrific. You're a role model. <laughs> yeah. You are a role model. <laughs> well, I think part of it is is just what you're you're experiencing is getting girls to experience success. So give those early experiences in science and math, and and understand what engineers do. You're actually doing engineering. You do know that, right? Yeah. Uh, and and think about how you can not only use current technology but invent it. So I think success breeds success. So the more opportunities both communities, uh, schools, federal government. We do a lot with museums and science centers. We need to give a lot of young women that experience for success and a lot of role models. Um, we have fabulous women that have been very successful in NASA missions and explorations. And so um, think about them, but also think about how you can be a role model for those youngers who are doing a great job. Thank you. Great. Another question? Yes. Hello, I'm Becky Shanahan from the Society of Women Engineers. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that the Society of Women Engineers and all my colleagues working for women in STEM, I think we could do uh, nothing better to thank all of you who have blazed the trails for Title IX than to give the same advances to women in STEM as you've done for women in sports. So that's yeah. our, our objective. Uh, but I want to comment and lead to a question on a few things that were said. I think we're not looking at things broadly enough. There's discussions about harassment, but I think what women in STEM is facing is much more subtle than just harassment. It's a culture that uh, discourages, it's barriers that, that aren't identified. And when we talk about educating people, I think we need to educate more than, than parents. I think we need to educate the administration. And uh, I believe and one of our public policy initiatives is to show how Title IX can be a tool for advancing women in STEM. 
So I wanted to, particularly maybe with Dr. Winterton, talk, uh, ask her to talk a little bit about some of the audits that NASA has done and some of the advancements you've made thanks to the timeline audits. Um, yes, we have a very uh, committed effort within NASA to go in and look at Title IX efforts within universities and programs that receive our dollars. And we're finding some best practices, but we're finding some challenges as well. Uh, certainly helping women who are in undergraduate graduate also see the career pathway, the scholarships, the opportunities, as mentioned. So you're going into a workplace where you've got a good paying job without the, the debt that's going to restrict you. So that's a commitment NASA has made, that we're going to continue to look at what are successes with Title IX implementation, but what are the challenges that we need to continually overcome. So it is a critical, important area for us. And it's also, it's not just NASA, right? It's NSF, it's the Department of Energy, as they conduct those audits uh, pursuant to the 1994 GAO report. Um, and it's around a kind of interagency coordination and collaboration that the White House Council on Women and Girls, for example, is really providing a venue to do just that so that we can bring all of the resources and the acumen to bear on this problem. Give me two seconds on the women and girls because I didn't really talk about it that much. The president announced a White House Council on Women and Girls and it's made up of all of the um, departments and agencies within the federal government. And Tina, in her role as executive director, meets on a regular basis, as do I. And in fact, the first lady came to our last meeting. And our goal right now over the course of the summer is to look at all the different federal programs that touch the lives of women and girls. And let's look at them and see whether we're actually doing the job that we set out to do. And what could we do better? What are new initiatives that we could do administratively? We are working with um, the women in both the House and in the Senate to think about what legislation we could put forward. And the goal is to say, at the federal level, we should be doing whatever we can within our power to lift up the lives of women and girls. And so that's what really led us to this event here today. We have time for just a couple more questions. And yes, all the way in the back, please. Hi, my name is Sean Ladd. I teach at Manhattan College in the beautiful Bronx. And I'm also president of the National Association for Girls and Women in Sport. I appreciate your comments um, living in the Bronx about urban girls. It's so important to empower them. Quality physical education is going to help that. So the Big Kids Act, um, no child left behind. I always say every child with a big behind because we don't have Thank all of you. I, as a junior at Penn State, filed a Title IX complaint and eventually had varsity women's soccer. It took us a while. Congratulations. Uh, I appreciate all of your efforts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Terry Lukowski, the public policy director for the Women's Sports Foundation. I guess it's directed to Marsha and Jessica. We talked a lot about the benefits that we've seen in Title IX and it's related to athletics, and I think all the athletes on the panel are, are a great testament to that. But can you talk about what the landscape is like today in terms of some of the challenges that still remain, and what is the action you think we need to see happen in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Great one. Well, I, I'm happy to just uh, start even in the area of athletics. I mean, one of the things that was great about athletics, in a certain sense, is there are teams for boys, teams for girls. So you can see pretty well straight out what's fair and what isn't, mostly. Uh, and be, we can pretty much see right now that women are still not getting the same opportunities to play, even with all the progress that we made. So it's still low 40 percent of the opportunities to play in intercollegiate <coughs> athletics schools are making available to their female students, even though they're more than 50 percent of the student population. So that means less chance to play, less chance to get college scholarships less chance to get training in uh, sports field, which is a very important field for employment into the future. Less chance for business uh, development and skills, because we see a correlation between athletics and women who become business leaders later in life. Less healthy outcomes in life, too. We see the same kinds of less opportunities to play being made available in the elementary and high school levels, too. So that's one of the big, most important issues. Get more opportunities to play sports. And then when the young women do have the opportunity to play, we're still seeing they're being shortchanged in the kinds of resources that are being given to women's teams. So that 
that has to happen as well. But also, I think outside of sports, there's so, so much more attention that needs to be paid on what Title IX really means. It was because of Title IX that we no longer have home ec just for girls and shop for boys. And if you wanted to take a shop class pre-Title IX, it was okay for the school to say, oh, no, you're not allowed to. Yeah. Well, those explicit barriers are down, but we still don't see a lot of the career technical education programs are just as segregated by sex now as the medical schools and the law schools used to be in the early 70s. And that those fields which keep kids in school, help prevent dropouts, are very good for low-income kids and tie in, can tie in math and science to very direct career training and education and really involve them in, so that they can see the connection between what they're learning and what they could be earning. We've got loads of work to do when we see some high schools, aviation high school, in uh, you know, nine, over 90% of the students there being male in one of our biggest cities, cosmetology, much lower earnings, not health insurance, not fringe benefits, a lot of young girls going into it, and they're not getting all the math and the science and the other skills that they need. So a lot more to be done. Jessica, oh. did you want to say something about Billie Jean? Yeah. No, what Jessica's saying. Okay. <laughs> well, and as much as today is, is such a celebration of, of how far we have come, and um, a, a big part of that, I know at the high school level, and Marsha, you touched on this a little, I mean, there's still 1.3 million um, less girls that play sports than boys. And when you start to think about the numbers, and gosh, you even take five less girls. And I, I think about the girls I work with, and you multiply that to 1.3 million. It's just opportunity. Um, but to go along with a lot that we've all said, too, is, is the role models. You know, we talked about Donna and Lillian that are here, mm -hmm. amazing athletes, champion athletes before us. But the coaches and athletic directors, um, that's something that, Title IX also helps. So as much as we're talking about the athletes, mm -hmm. there's the importance of seeing leadership, seeing that my coach and my athletic director are successful, amazing women along, along with the teachers. And I know that that makes such a difference um, for me, for such, uh, so many of the young women. It helps to have great role models like my father and Billy's father, but to actually see successful women in the higher positions. And, you know, right now, Division I, you know, it's 8.4%. 8 Billy's giving me the stats. 8.4% Division athletic I. Athletic directors. Of di athletic directors. So you just think about, you know, gosh, just being able to look up and see, look at this, like, you know. Yeah, you got to <laughs> see it to be it. You have to see it to be it. Yeah. Amazing. If you don't women. see it, how, you, you don't think yeah. about being it. Mm -hmm. so that can really be our important. slogan. So yeah. one, one more question, and then we're going to do a student right here. Oh, all right. We'll do there a student, and then we'll be around okay. after to, um, to chat. Yes. I'm from Ferndon High School, and I feel that ever since elementary school, less has been expected of, of female athletes. And I would like to know what is It's a very that is <laughs> Well, I would say that I came from an environment, though, when I was growing up, and I was influenced by my coach. And honestly, I didn't listen to what was going on around me. I remember out doing the boys in seventh grade doing 33 chin-ups. So my whole thing is, is I was encouraged and motivated by my coach. She did not let me read the media. She did not let me read the newspaper of what was being said about me or what people thought of women's sports. And I would encourage you, until we make all the changes we need to make, I want to encourage you to do that as well. And if someone tells the boys to do something, I want you to up that number. It's all about the environment and the, the environment that you're in, the teachers and the coaches and the parents and what they think of you, I think, should matter more than anything. Senator Bach. You know, I, uh, so Dominique can testify, I get pretty emotional about this. I'm listening to all of you. Uh, my own personal experience was two strong women in my family. <laughs> Having just fought the battle with Margaret Spelling and Rod Page, I think all of us 
Jessica, I want to say to you, to the Secretary, Russell, to the President, how grateful we are that you have taken us out of the wilderness <laughs> and moving us into the sunshine. <laughs> thank you. Sweet. Thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you. And also, I must say, on a personal note, to those of you who are on the firing line when the sun was in the clouds, Billy Jean, what's that name? Marcia. Again? Oh, Marcia. <laughs> Donna, Christine, and many others here. We were on those Thursday calls. <laughs> How grateful we were for you being in the trenches then. But I'm going to say it isn't enough to be grateful we are where we are now. We must work just as hard to get where we need to go in the future. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. <laughs>